assalamu alaikum everybody hope you're all safe sound and healthy and right now as we know there has been the greek tragedy uh for the want of a better word uh basically there was a ship that was going from libya to greece and as we know it drowned now the worrying aspect is that first of all i don't know if anybody's noticed it but it's this is a bit too frequent it's a bit too frequent the way um ships seem to drown near greece uh, on the waters of greece and i think i'm not the only one that found it so worrying i think the greek population the the people of greece have also found it very suspicious maybe and that is why they are now protesting against their own government uh for incompetence uh, in, with dealing with this situation of ships coming in with immigrants legal or illegal that's a different matter but the point is that you know that every year there is a ship or two that comes in with a lot of people and almost um i mean and majority of the times something happens to that ship and people get killed people are drowned now the more worrying aspect here is that although of majority of the they were from all over the world they were different from different countries but there was a huge number of pakistanis in that ship about 400 and they were forced to go to the lower deck this is something that was mentioned by the guardian and there is also reference from the observer as to the details of this this whole uh you know this whole situation the condition in which the pakistanis were kept they were forced to ride on the lower deck and if some of them would come up for maybe fresh water to drink or for something else so they would just try to leave the lower deck then they were very badly treated by the crew of the ship um they were even physically assaulted and pushed back down to the lower deck now you do understand the importance of this 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 whole observation of this fact because that means that the pakistanis were deliberately put in danger by the crew of the ship you need to note that pakistan is legal or illegal uh, all of these immigrants when they take the ship they pay a huge amount of money to the agents concerned they pay they pay a huge amount of money to the ships concerned that are taking them so uh pakistanis do not pay any less if anything they probably pay more than the other countries so to treat them like that 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 tells you the whole scenario of the condition uh or the situation that pakistan is internationally although this is one could debate that it has nothing to do with the government the fact that the government is illegal and the fact that pakistan is right now in its worst form of crisis and that is why the world has no respect for pakistan or pakistanis but we could argue uh you know that it it is as i said that um it has nothing to do with that and that you know this has been going on for decades uh but i do think that it has increased and whenever this government is in power uh we have noticed how the international uh world treats us we have seen a stark difference uh you know during uh the during musharraf's time we were well respected during imran khan's time we were well respected people were forced to respect the pakistani passport and pakistani people uh but whenever we have uh nawaz sharif shahbaz sharif zardari in the mix then we are treated very badly very rudely um not just those who are traveling illegally we're talking about those who have been traveling legally okay yeah because i've been amongst those and i've been a frequent traveler my whole life i was born abroad bred abroad shifted to pakistan still moved abroad and then again back to pakistan so i've traveled a lot and i can tell you i have seen a stark difference in the treatment of pakistanis by the western countries and the arabian countries both during musharraf's time and imran khan's time and then during nawaz sharif's time and zardari's time and um i am not somebody who likes to be degraded or humiliated just because of the passport that i'm holding so unlike me most of the pakistanis they just take it quietly but because i am a person who does not give two hoots about what you think about me and my country i give it to them so if there is a staff in the airport who acts badly with me i give it to them 
but it is a fact that we are treated very very differently depending on who our government is which is quite wrong because we don't treat others differently depending on who their government is when americans had trump did you see us treating the americans badly although actually we should have if we kept on that logic because america uses that logic in the way it treats other people and so does britain and so does the so do the arab countries anyway moving on the second most worrying or concerning news here is the rumor that the government tried to spread uh, i mean you can see how pathetic and how ridiculous and how absolutely ridiculously aholic this government is that uh, they actually tried to take advantage of this shipwreck um by saying that by spreading the rumor that imran riaz khan has died in the ship like are you seriously out of your freaking mind the man was legally traveling he was at the airport when he was kidnapped by the law enforcement agencies okay he has been in pakistan this whole time even though the ig of punjab has tried to create these stories these soap operas uh sending him to afghanistan and now suddenly sending him to afghanistan and from there to iran and then from there to turkey and then in that ship you do realize that that ship did not go from turkey that ship went from libya like hello seriously where do you live do you even know what's going on in real life like which world do you live in seriously um and you know uh, the but, but the worrying aspect that i'm saying the concerning aspect of this this rumor is the suspicion that they have either assassinated Imran Riaz Khan or they are planning to and that is very very concerning the fact that America and Britain started this whole shit and it has gone out of control it's spinning way out of their control and they're just standing frozen absolutely frozen because they don't know what to do next you should have been ready to know what to do next you should have had plan b you should have had plan c i mean how could you not realize that things would go south so quickly you're fucking with the people right now and these are people who are no longer the same old generation this is the new generation that you're screwing with and then this is imran khan's awakened country this is a country that imran khan has spent 27 years to wake up and you actually think that you could mess with this country again and it will just all go so smoothly no you should have had a plan b you should have realized that things can go south and then what you need to do cut your losses that's what you always do anyway so why is it that you're not quick to cut your losses oh i see because adari just promised you that he delivers and in the past he has delivered so okay let's see where he uh, where he goes from here and then let's see where you go from here No, this is the difference between civilized countries and countries like ours which is why I keep on and on saying that I really have no expectations or hope from the people of Pakistan and that is why I do say that the people of Pakistan actually went against um you know my expectations uh when they protested so vehemently before the elections during the elections and then after that when imran khan was ousted i mean the, you know they they were awake they were alive they were protesting but now now the they're once more sitting in at home and waiting and watching and waiting and watching and confused so i don't know i seriously don't know have we gone back to falling asleep have 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 we decided to just faint and you know just uh, faint death what is it because look again we have nothing to lose now the country is already fucked right businesses are closed education centers are fucked um there is no revenue there is no gdp there is no production there is no growth there is nothing everything is already closed so why not, why aren't we flooding the streets that's what i want to know uh what are you waiting for if you're waiting for imran khan to come and lead you you did not wait for him when he was ousted and you came out and that was kudos man kudos to you that was the right way to do things yes he kind of ruined it all by telling everybody to just calm down and you know stay back and don't do anything wait for his call but again now you need to know that a leader or no leader we need to get out because this is for our own freedom that we're fighting look at the greek populace again i mean look at them they are protesting against their government for something that has nothing to do with them and then look at us we have bigger problems here and we're not doing anything
um, we're, we're, you know, we're having uh, accidental deaths, we're having uh, murders, we're having kidnaps, we're having assassinations. We are having bigger problems and we're not doing anything. I'm telling you again, this is the last chance for the people of Pakistan to flood the streets, shut down the state and overthrow this government. Otherwise, you are forever doomed. And as we know, ministers are uh, re resigning left, right and center. So I guess maybe the people of Pakistan are thinking, OK, the government is collapsing on its own. It's it's going to shit. It's becoming a rubble, you know, so it's going they will have no choice but to dissolve the assemblies. Are you sure? That's what you thought when uh, Imran Khan dissolved the uh, called for the dissolution of uh, Punjab assembly and KPK's assembly, right? You thought that, oh, that will force the government to dissolve the assemblies, did it? What did I tell you then? I told you that this is a chance that the government is waiting for. They're just going to pounce on it and they're going to get their people in. And that's what they did. They got their people in in the name of a caretaker government in each province. And those caretaker governments have still not left the provinces. They are still there, despite the fact that they have long expired. So yeah, no don't don't think this country is not run by people who work on logic okay so whatever common sense you're thinking about whatever logic you're thinking about throw it out the window okay you're dealing with a-holes you're dealing with donkeys you're dealing with people who have who are just running around like headless chicken okay just think about that you think you're dealing with headless chicken okay what do you do with the headless chicken yeah exactly so Stop waiting, okay? You're thinking that the ministers are resigning, the attorney uh, general is resigning, the chairman of NAB has resigned, chairman of Nadra has resigned, you know, um, the minister, uh, Shahid Khan Abbasi, who's one of the oldest, uh, most staunch members of uh, Noon League of, you know, Nawashi's party, he's resigned because of his um, internal conflict with uh, Shabash Sharif and with the way uh, Noon League is uh, doing things. Uh, but, but again, don't sit and wait it out, okay? Even if they collapse, you need to understand Zardari is planning the whole collapse because he's going to swoop in and he's the vulture that's going to take over. He's already announced his, his uh, you know, agenda. So don't sit and wait, please. Become the active, woke Pakistanis once more. Get off your asses. Flood the streets. Shut the country down. Kick everybody out. There is no other way. Now, we need to understand the rapid brain drain and the rapid uh, influx, uh, the movement of people out of Pakistan. Um, brain drain has been... Um, at its peak since this government has come since this illegal government has come so for this this throughout this year we have seen the biggest brain drain ever in the history of the country and now apart from that obviously those who can who do not have anything to offer but they just have to leave the country because it's just barely surviving now now you need to understand this is a country that has never seen hunger and poverty before not in its true sense even the poor people never slept hungry um, in the villages you know they you have huge massive productions of food there's a lot of cultivation there's a lot of harvest that you will never have any any uh, shortage of food in a country like ours but for the first time in history there is shortage of food thanks to this government and then this government the budget that it just gave as always every single time you have a sagdar you can already real you can you, you just can already predict what what the budget is going to be and they have literally uh, it's it's been the last straw that broke the camel's back okay basically so right now the height of of um, brutality uh, of the government towards the people, towards um, social media, YouTubers, towards uh, journalists, 
um, towards women. And I'm amazed because this is a question I keep on and on asking. Um, now, why is the media quiet? Why is the mainstream media quiet? During Imran Khan's time when they had the most freedom ever, they kept screaming about freedom of the press. And now, you know, you know when you, that your press isn't free when your press cannot even complain about freedom of the press. So this is how free our media is right now, that they can't even talk about the freedom of press. And then, uh, you know, the women who always marched about women empowerment, you know, where are all those women now? Women are being raped, women are being sexually molested, women are being stripped naked, women are being kidnapped from their homes. So where are you? I don't see you. Where are you? You know, these are the two people I have been const constantly looking for for this whole year and not a peak. And that shows you where these people actually came from, who brought them, who hired them, who used them, and what their reality is in the face of, of, of uh, you know, true disaster or true crisis. And so people are leaving the country, okay, because they see no future. This is something that I uh, already predicted more than 12 years ago when I said that this country now has no future. And people had hope in Imran Khan, but I knew that the people of this country are steeped so much into, in corruption and dishonesty and shortcuts. In, uh, you know, they're just so asleep that it took him 27 years just to wake them up. Um, you know, it's, uh, this, is, this, is, this is not a country that's going to stay awake for long. And as we can see, yes, this country tried to stay awake and then <laughs> it's again kind of died. So basically, the people of the country are thinking that it's just, just better to just leave than to, you know, fight with these a-holes. But that's the wrong attitude, really. Um, where will we go? It's true that we have the, you know, the, the, a huge majority of uh, youth um, and, and the world demands uh, uh, the, this, this particular resource. But really, I mean, why? Why should we have to leave? Why should we have to go and struggle over and over again, start from zero over and over again? My biggest problem with this country is that I've had to start from zero over and over again. Why? Why do I have to go abroad and then start from zero and then be dragged back to this country and then start from zero and then go back abroad and start from zero and then again get dragged back to this God for second place and start from zero? Why? Why can't we have a freaking place where we can just live in freaking peace, you know? Why? Why can't we just have our basic uh, needs met? Why can't we just have electricity, gas, and water? None of which we have a shortage of, by the way. Every single one of these utilities have been deliberately, deliberately uh, put, this, this, the shortage that we're facing is deliberate, okay? It's artificial, it's not natural, it's not real. And why? Why do we have to tolerate that, you know? Why do we have to move to another place just to get our basic rights? Why? So this is what we need to right now think, and this is how we need to think right now, and we need to stand up and fight again, okay? Because right now, in, we are, we're moving towards despair. I know that. Uh, because we're like, okay, that's it. Fuck it. You know, it's just not worth it. Yes, it's not worth it, but you know when it will be worth it? It's when you actually start changing within. You need to change yourselves in order for the change in this country to actually happen and to be permanent. You know, uh, you can't rely on one man to change this country. This country cannot be changed by one man. This country has to change itself in order to work with the man to change the whole damn thing. Okay? You need to understand that. And you do, actually, people, you do. But again, we're too lazy. We're too lazy. We can't be bothered, you know? We just can't be bothered. Well, then, you know what? Live like this. Enjoy this forever. This is your future. And you know why? Because um, uh, the way other countries are suffering right now, thanks to America and the war that it's, it's conducting, you know, uh, I'm sorry, but um, you won't even be able to get opportunities abroad. You know, this, this, is, this is also temporary. You need to look at the bigger picture and you need to look at the, you know, long term, uh, you know, consequences and results and solutions of whatever plan it is that you're making. You really need to think long term. Long term tells you that this is not really a good idea. OK, you will run away from this country. You will go and finally get some opportunities. But then the ones after you, 
and then the ones after them. Because the world is in a crisis right now. The world can only afford so much. Their own people are right now hopeless, jobless, homeless. Okay? And what happens when you're hopeless, jobless, and homeless? Yeah, conflict. Conflict begins. And then again, you know, that whole racism, discrimination, this, that, economic crisis, social crisis, political crisis, it will all begin. And then again, where will you go? You know, we can't keep hopping from place to place to look for the, you know, everybody's going to start hopping and then there's no place left. You know, that's how it's going to be. At the end, there'll be no place left. So we need to understand that. We need to think to that extent in order to measure uh, what it, uh, to weigh and to measure our movement and our plans and our agenda. So the, the, the amount of people that are leaving this country is dangerously high. People are leaving both legally and illegally and things are going to happen. Uh, but I think better than that is that we should just stand up and tell the government, you know what, screw you, we've given you one freaking year, you need to just get out, of our, get out of our face now, you know, just go do what it is that you do best, go screw yourselves, okay, stop screwing with us. And then we, and after that, you know, we really need to give a clear message to America and the UK, um, what happens to countries that mess with us? Because I think enough is enough. 70 years of messing with us is, is, is almost a century, for God's sake. It's not, um, I mean, I thought we had sort of gained freedom from them, but it doesn't seem like, it seems like we're still one way or the other, just a part of the colony. So, you know, you need to decide what the status of your country really needs to be. Uh, coming back to Imran Khan's speech, um, which is referred to as one of the most important speeches of his till date, because he has uh, given messages both to the public as well as to the establishment. Um, as I had mentioned in my earlier episodes, um, Imran Khan had uh, constantly rejected and refused the establishment uh, when it came to him for deals. Um, after making such a big statement on TV, I'm sure the establishment is now pretty humiliated um, and, and it's pretty much uh, trapped its own self. In other words, you know, it shot itself in, the, in its own foot. Because if you remember um, that specific lady who spoke on behalf of the establishment when she came and said that, um, who do you think you are, you know, we got rid of Bhutto, we got rid of Nawaz Sharif, and now you dared to glare at us and we are gouging your eyes out. It's your turn. So now whose turn is it? Whose eyes got gouged out, really? The establishment is now uh, having kittens. It's on panic mode. It overestimated itself. It underestimated the public's relationship with um, Imran Khan. It underestimated the generation because it itself does not belong to our generation. The establishment is made up of old farts. They're still thinking of how things were in their own time and they're still thinking of old tricks that probably worked for and with their generation. But as I keep on saying, it doesn't work with us. It doesn't work with our generation and the generation after us is even worse. So, you know, just keep on trying till you die and very badly and miserably. So basically Imran Khan, uh, as I said, he had rejected all their offers, especially when they wanted him to, you know, save their face and just give an apology uh, regarding 9 May so that they can, you know, initiate talks. And he flatly refused. So today in his speech, he actually once again, very openly in front of the public, refused all offers of deals. He refused leaving the country and he has once again told the public that it is time now that the public decide whether they want to remain enslaved and reach their doom in a country that has no future or they would rise up and fight for it. Because you need to understand um, in Islam, this is also a jihad, which he's mentioned in his previous speech. It is definitely a jihad. Um, what he did not mention, I guess he was too gentle to do so, but what he did not mention in his previous speech, as well as in today's speech, is that jihad against such a government is incumbent upon all Muslims. So 
uh, a Muslim is not supposed to live in enslavement of any kind. A Muslim is not supposed to live in oppression of any kind. Um, a Muslim has two choices. Either he should leave that land that oppresses him, leave that life that oppresses him, and venture off to a better life, a better option, or he should stand up and fight for his rights and for his freedom. So these are the two choices we have. Those who can leave will leave, and they're already leaving, as I've mentioned before, and as Imran Khan has also mentioned in his speech today, that people are leaving. But again, those of us who cannot leave, we need to decide how to recapture the country, how to reset standards, how to revamp the whole system. Now, um, after this speech of his, there has been a lot of movement on the inside. Um, you know, the GHQ especially has once again become very active. The GHQ has been quite active for quite some time in the sense that, um, you know, the establishment, the army, they have been trying to save face and they've been trying to get things better with Imran Khan. But the truth is that they themselves have made things so bad, things have become so worse um, that they're literally, uh, as I said before, they have trapped themselves and they are at a dead end. So there's no way out for them. There's only one way out, and that is that they openly accept that they were wrong, and they back out, and they stop working with the traitors and the fifth columnists, and they stop take or, or taking orders uh, from the U.S. and the U.K., and they better shut up and go back into the hole that they crawled out from and let us get our country back in shape. Um, and for which, of, obviously, it's important that Imran Khan gets back. There is no minusing Imran Khan. Minusing Imran Khan is minusing the public of Pakistan, which means you're minusing the state itself. When there is no state, whose establishment will you be? Whose army will you be? Whose government will you be? You need a state in order to be all these things, as I've said many times before. And you need uh, people in order to have a state, unless you want to rule over empty lots. Now, suit yourself. And while we're at it, you know, Khwaja Asif, amongst all the other barks that he's been barking and the farts that he's been farting in the assembly, in the parliament, you know, where he abused the overseas Pakistanis, all, which although, it, to be very honest, it looked, as if, um, it looked as if he was talking about Nawaz Sharif because the thing about coming to Pakistan just to bury the dead, you know, and speaking in English and saying that, you know, you are foreign passport holders, um, that is actually exactly what Nawaz Sharif's sons did and what Nawaz Sharif and his daughter did. So are you talking about your own leader? Hmm. I don't know, you know, and the thing about this this dog is that he always barks senselessly and then at the end he has to issue an apology. Why do you even bark, seriously? Or is that part of your strategy? Let me just, you know, get all the fart out of my system and I can always apologize later, you know. Who cares? The stink will always go away, right? Is that how you think, you mofo? And now he's, you know, he, he not only insulted the overseas Pakistanis in that rant of his in the parliament he insulted doctors he insulted lawyers he insulted god knows who he insulted every single professional uh, field in pakistan every single uh, person uh, every single skillful talented capable person who is here on merit in pakistan and you know the amount of garbage that he spewed out of his mouth you know in which after which he was forced to issue an apology um, how dare you uh, abuse the people who represent your country in a more uh, effective way than you have? You've never even you have never even represented your own country. I mean, who are you really representing? You're representing the U.S. You're representing the U.K. You're not representing us. And at the same time, you know, um, the brutality towards. Uh, businessmen uh, in general, and we're talking about small businesses. Remember, in Imran, in, in Imran Khan's time, focus was given to small industries and small businesses so that they could grow. Um, and Khwaja Asif, again, one doesn't know who he's talking about because whatever he's saying is actually, it's been implemented by his own government every single time. Every single time his government has come into play, um, they have uh, you know, given relief to the elites. They have 
uh, robbed the rest of the ordinary people of uh, their money by, uh, you know, have putting heavy duties and levies and taxes. And they never put those heavy duties and levies and taxes on the elites. Remember the sugar mill scandals and remember the, the wheat flour scandals because these people are the mill owners. Um, Nawaz Sharif's party people, they are the mill owners. They are the ones who are behind the land mafia. They are the ones who are behind business mafia. They are the ones who are behind the petroleum mafia. Although actually Zardari is the bigger petroleum mafia, but still. So um, how dare he talk? I mean, seriously, who is he talking to and who is he talking about? Is he acting as the opposition in the parliament as he's talking about what ex- what it is that his own government has wreaked havoc with this country? I mean, seriously, what is it that you, who is it that you're talking about? And what is it that you're trying to say here? Because it's you people. And in fact, Zardari very openly, the day he declared himself dawn, that was the day when he came and he talked, uh, you know, on the record in front of the camera, in front of the mainstream media, he very openly and shamelessly told the businessmen that you continue doing your business. Don't worry. In fact, you should unite together, form a syndicate and then support me. And then when I will come into power, the first thing I'll do is I'll give you relief and I'll support you. You continue to support me and I'll continue to support you. And we'll eat together. Seriously, you're going to eat together? You know, it means that you're going to just fuck the whole country together like a fucking mafia? Yeah, in your dreams, man, in your dreams. And talking about geofencing, you know, I mean, as if it wasn't enough that they have uh, hired and paid off their own supporters to come and make false confessions about 9th May. Um, in their so-called geofencing, they've even decided to illegally arrest a national athlete. And she's a female. Uh, wait, sorry, is that why you targeted her? Because she's a female? Is that what you're trying? Is that the message here that you're giving? that you are going to target any and every female in Pakistan as long as she's capable? Is that it? Is that what you're going for? On one side, Zardari is telling the elite businessmen, oh, keep on doing your businesses and form a syndicate. And on the other side, uh, we've got Shabash Sharif and his minions going around sealing other people's businesses um, simply because they are pro-PTI or they support PTI. And they have one condition. Uh, We will let you run your business if you just come and do a press conference and speak against Imran Khan. So what exactly is it that you're trying to achieve? If the you have already offended the overseas Pakistanis, you've always you've already offended the Chamber of Commerce in Pakistan. Um, you know all those kickbacks that you love to take. Where you get them? Where are you going to get them now from? Seriously, where exactly are you headed with all of this charade? Or again, it means that I'm right, right? It means I am absolutely right when I say that the whole agenda was to come destroy Pakistan take whatever you can in the midst of it and run away. Now, if you remember, um, just a a little while back, I was talking about Khwaja uh, Khwaja Asif, you know, offending the overseas Pakistanis. Now, remember the overseas Pakistanis are, as I keep on saying, they are the reason Pakistan is surviving today. They are the reason these mofos are surviving today. The minute the overseas Pakistanis decide to not send a single cent into this country, this country will collapse within 24 hours. You just see how this country collapses, okay? I mean, I too was once upon a time an overseas Pakistani. My family was once upon a time overseas Pakistanis. Half of my family still is part of the overseas Pakistanis, okay? So you should never underestimate the power of overseas Pakistanis. They are the real asset of your country. That is a fact. They are the ones that bring in the foreign currency. They are the ones that help your currency, uh, the the value of your currency, they help boost it. So um, the offensive remark by Khwaja Asif and the recent um, uh, speech by Imran Khan, um, they have both because Imran Khan keeps on calling them assets and he keeps on saying that they are some extremely powerful and that we do know that some of the richest families 
um, abroad are basically Pakistanis, overseas Pakistanis, and uh, they um, they have they have so much more money than even our country's budget. You could say so don't just think that it's only you know the white man that is rich and can have a, a budget that is big enough to own an island we've got uh, many Pakistanis who are in that category as well now the thing is that um, the result of these two um, of this first of all it's basically you can say the collective result because if you remember I'd mentioned how Muid Pirzada had also talked about how the overseas Pakistanis that especially in America who were basically half asleep most of the time because they kept on relying on the embassy of Pakistan um, you know to get stuff done um, that they have suddenly woken up and taken the power back into their hands which is something that the overseas Indians the they have been doing that uh, for a long time in America, they have been exerting their power, uh, but the overseas Pakistanis have never really done that before. But now, because of all that has happened, this whole, uh, you know, this whole thuggery that just took place uh, by the PDM, um, the ousting of Imran Khan, all the illegal activities, the violations of human rights, the violation of the constitution, the violation of the law, the legal system, of the judiciary, um, the uh, inherent uh, violation of women and their rights of older men, older women and children. Basically, the, the you know, the what we call in our language, the badmashi that has been going on. So they have decided that enough is enough and now they are going to take action. What action are they taking? About 1,000 overseas Pakistanis are coming to Pakistan, obviously um, of their own volition, they are going to pay for this trip themselves, even though it is going to be an official capacity, which means that basically they're coming to Pakistan uh, uh, in order to officially conduct an investigation on what's going on. But obviously, it's out of their own pocket. Um, at the same time, they'll be bringing with them uh, international media, it is expected. And they will work with the international media to uh, collect evidence and to expose exactly what it is that this illegal government is doing and has been doing. So uh, the government is now having kittens, the establishment is having kittens because they're basically shitting their pants really because they know, they do know the power. Now they're going to actually get a taste of that power of the overseas Pakistanis that they just offended. And the, the fact that you have a, at least a thousand people coming um, so they're thinking that, oh, God, we've got a thousand people coming from the U.S. Now suddenly they've become Americans, okay? So now they've got a thousand Americans coming to protect Imran Khan. Yeah, these Americans, these are the Pakistanis. These are the real Pakistanis. These are who I always refer to as real Pakistanis. Those of us who have lived abroad, the, the amount of patriotism that we have, I'm sorry to say, but the people within Pakistan... They don't know jack shit about patriotism. They're not patriots. I would say this country has been hijacked by uh, traitors right from the start. And it is their descendants that are overflowing within this country. This is, this, there is no other way I can see it. Because I swear, the feelings that overseas Pakistanis have towards Pakistan, the heightened shame, the heightened pride, the ego... The, you know, the, the, the sensitivity, the emotions that we go through when we're abroad and we listen to people and how they talk about our country. You people will never go through that living in Pakistan, you know. We work hard out there abroad and then we have to listen to bullshit about our country. Um, you don't know how it feels because, first of all, in Pakistan, people have forgotten how to work hard. Everybody's on looking for the sh for shortcuts. Everybody's look is is looking for ways to harm others. You know, to stomp on others, to drag others down, to pull other people's legs. That that is all you see here amongst the domesticated Pakistanis, and I'll call them domesticated. I don't care what you say. So. Uh, yeah, you haven't yet seen the power and the wrath of overseas Pakistanis, but now you are definitely going to get it, especially when you've actually even, uh, you know, you've actually, you're such cowards that you actually 
picked a fight with a teenager, no less, in, in, U- in the UK, Shayan Ali. Seriously, you're fighting with a kid, you know, you, you actually even tried to um, ban him from taking his A-level exams? Seriously? Like, what the hell is wrong with you people that you're picking fights with a kid? Even a kid has much more guts than you do. You know, you're picking fights with women. You're picking fights with kids abroad, no less, in England. So it means you're trying to prove to the world that we are right when we say that you are British spies and England has given you refuge and you are working on British agenda to keep Pakistan under British colonialism. Is that it? Because that is exactly what it looks like, the way you people are behaving with British Pakistanis. Shame on you. Okay, shame on you. So one is also expecting, uh, as I come back to the original point, one is expecting not just the media, but they are expecting um, human rights organizations. They are expecting um, international organizations um, that look into violations of constitutional and 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 law, and uh, you know and human rights violations collectively. So we are going to expect uh, in a lot of international organizations coming with these uh, 1,000 overseas Pakistanis that are coming from the US. Um, as uh, as you know, I mean, it's been mentioned even uh, by Mohit Pirzada like a few days back when he talked about how suddenly the Pakistanis are waking up in the U.S. after a long slumber. Um, if you remember, he had also talked about, I um, mean, not just him, but I think uh, um, one or two other journalists like Osama and maybe Maktoum and Abid Andalib, I think even they have talked about it. Um, it's It was the fact that the especially the recent violations of constitution and the fact that the government was trying to initiate even more illegal activities that would violate the constitution altogether, um, that that report would be seeping through to the international organizations concerned and that it would take them a few days to, you know, gather reports and and to begin their process of uh, voicing uh, against the government's illegal activities. So I think um, those uh, will be included in the visit to Pakistan. Um, and again, remember, although this may be an official visit, but it is not at all um, funded by any government, uh, be it Pakistan or UK or the US. No, no, no. This is entirely out of the pockets of these overseas Pakistanis, they are funding it themselves. They're funding this visit themselves. And the core um, idea of this visit is that they would come here and they would do their own investigation. They would do their own research and they would gather evidence and they would gather um, and they would, you know, uh, gather more information on the ground level, basically, because you can't trust the media in any case. And uh, here is something that I've said many times before, but I do not mind reiterating myself. Do not by any means think that the Western media is also completely free. No, They're, they are also under certain mandatory censorship principles or laws. Um, and they have there are certain news that they have to give in a certain way. There is always a propaganda issued by the government that they have to follow. And even though they are trying to be as open as they can, you will notice in the BBC and in uh, one or two other American channels, you will notice that they are forced to sometimes twist the news in such a way where it should not be entirely against the Pakistani government or not entirely against uh, and not entirely exposing the illegal activities or the the, the uh, reactions of the people on ground level. You understand so they are being as open as they can yes but there is always you know a certain bit of censorship even within their channels um, India is heavily censored as we all know um, the Western channels the Western mainstream media are um, not as heavily censored as the Indian media and, and now the Pakistani media is completely chained up and you know there's a tape on their mouth though as i say they kind of deserve it because look when you lie with the enemy you're going to get what you're going to get um so the western media is by no means 100 percent free you need to remember that that is why there is certain news 
that comes out in, in a certain way that leaves you flabbergasted because you don't know if they're actually on your side or not. Um, yeah, so that is how this kind of work around that scripted, um, sen- you know, that scripted uh, news, you can say. So they have this, sometimes there's a script that they have to follow and there is a dictation that they have to follow, but then they try to, you know, go around it in a clever way so that they can get what it is they want to get out and at the same time they can still stay within the realms of those sanctions or dictions or dictations or censorship. Okay, so when are they expected to come? They're expected to come on the 1st of July. Now here's an interesting thing. On one side we're hearing the fact that the uh, government is pushing for the arrest of Imran Khan uh, that at least till the 30th of June he has to be completely removed uh, from the whole scenario and I'm wondering if this has anything to do with the fact that these 1,000 overseas Pakistanis are coming with um, international media as well as international organizations on the 1st of July. Um, I I wonder if that's connected because um, I know some people would say that no it's it's, you know because of the uh, yeah elections fine but you know what the Supreme Court has been announcing or commanding or ordering them to uh, start with the election process for a very long time and they've been stalling and uh, the main reason they've been stalling is because the establishment knows that it will completely annihilate itself um, if it tries to put its hands on uh, Imran Khan or try to eradicate him, uh, you know, and through any rash means. So they want to take it slow, you know. They want to take it slow so that, you know, by the time they get it done, the public would, you know, not come in their way. Um, but they will have to rush because the government is in a rush. And the government is in a rush, I think, because the overseas Pakistanis are coming. So, you know, I think, I think it's sort of all that going on. Um, I might be wrong. Uh, Because the government is looking to uh, put Imran Khan away by the 30th max. And as Imran Khan has said in his speech tomorrow, uh, which is now literally today, because it is right now almost 4 a.m. in the morning, um, Imran Khan is expected to uh, once again go to court. And as he said uh, very clearly, that if any one judge succumbs to the pressure because as we know the judges have been threatened um, their servants have been beaten up injured kidnapped um, their families have been threatened so you know there's all that going on so the judges are under a lot of pressure uh, by the government and from the government so the if any one judge suddenly um, succumbs to the, that pressure um, then Imran Khan would be sent to jail because his bail would be revoked, you know. He's going there to get bail on some of the other fabricated cases against him. So there is that. And as he said, he's ready to go to jail. But the question is, what are we going to do? What are we going to do for ourselves now? Because if he's out of the picture, and if we're not going to stand up for our rights, then as I said it again and again and again, we're doomed. Um, again, don't think that because the overseas Pakistanis are coming, oh, stop looking at other people to save your ass, please. That is the reason why Pakistan is in the fucked up state that it is today, okay? It's because we're always sitting in our asses and we're just, you know, literally sitting on our haunches and we're thinking, oh, you know, some Musa will come and save us, some, you know, some saint will come and save us. Stop expecting people to do your work for you, okay? Get up. Get off of your ass and do it yourself. Okay, so while I'm still um, working on this episode of the podcast, some more news has come regarding uh, Khakan Abbasi. As as if you remember, it was mentioned that, um, you know, he's leaving or he's left um, Nawaz Sharif's party and he's one of the oldest members. Um, now there's some more news circulating that actually um, he may not leave after all because um, at the moment he was not given any real position in the party and he is uh, in England because um, he's had a few talks with Nawaz Sharif and he's like, uh, you know, Nawaz Sharif has called him over to um, 
you know have some important conversation so will that lead to the misunderstandings or the clashes um you know uh resolved or will that lead to him completely parting ways um because at the moment there it there is it is definite that he's clashed with Shubha Sharif and with and with how the the uh, Nawashi's party is working um that is that has been huge and he has as much i mean it basically it was uh that he wished to leave because um shabashi you know was saying that anybody who had a problem with his relatives should leave the party so i think even if he didn't say that it was in khakan abasi's mind to leave because he had had enough but then you never know because these people um they always like to strike deals unlike imran khan you know that's why they're having a problem with imran khan imran khan doesn't like to strike deals these people are always striking deals so you know you never know with these people what at what their end can be if he manages to you know uh clear these so called misunderstandings and if maybe they'll he be given a position that you know to calm him down and he might you know uh suddenly appear and say that all rumors about my clashes have been fabricated and i am still a member of the party you know the kind of statements they give let's see if yeah, people are probably confused as to why everybody's talking about khagan abasi you know shayad khagan abasi i mean what is the misunderstanding what is the conflict what is it actually he openly voiced his uh opinion um uh, regarding the case on Imran Khan in which he very openly um said that there is no case against Imran Khan and I don't see why you're fabricating cases against Imran Khan and um it's wrong he said it very openly then he said it very openly that he was against the military courts that it went against the constitution it went against it went against the law and that civilians cannot be tried in army courts as per the constitution of pakistan so these are the two points that he raised and he very openly he was uh, quite vocal um in his uh contradiction and he was quite uh vocal uh, in his speech against his own party's illegal activities uh, pertaining to imran khan's arrest and the cases on imran khan as well as pertaining to the mar- uh, the army courts and that is why um people said that you know he was being removed from the party which i think it's not he was being removed it's more like he decided to get out but again now the latest news is that he is in england um with the washrif and that they are expected to have a, a meeting or two that they've already had a chat over the phone maybe and that they're going to talk with each other but as i said you know we don't know what's going to happen next what deals they're going to strike is he really going to um accept a deal within his party amongst his party members to get a position or is he going to stand by his own words and maintain his stance let's see well until we get more clarity on the issues and the important um events or in that will be taking place this week starting from today this is me signing out khuda hafiz